Okay, so now when we talk about the large intestine, how long is the large intestine? So we say that this is going to be approximately 1.5 meters in length. Okay, roughly about 1.5 meters. When we talk about your small intestine, it was 6 meters. Okay, remember. Okay, but now, why do we call this thing large intestine? Even if its length is smaller than the small intestine, because it has a wider diameter. Okay, so always remember the diameter, the both sides is wider than the small intestine. And that is why we call it as the large intestine. But now, is this going to help in producing any uh, enzymes and is it going to help in digestion? The answer is no. Okay, so remember, this is not going to help in anything. So it doesn't produce enzymes. Doesn't produce enzymes at all. And because it is not producing enzymes, therefore, it doesn't help in digestion. Okay, but even if it is not helping in digestion, what is the job? It must be doing something. Guys, the major job of this is to absorb water. So it absorbs water from... Just a moment. Here. Okay, so what it does like all that semi-solid uh, food material, whatever that is there, the water is going to be removed and then the fecal matter is con Okay, but once again, when we talk about uh, the different parts, so we have said, guys, see, this is the one. So first one, okay, so we you know where the small intestine is going to meet with the large intestine what did we see this is nothing but our cecum okay so basically cecum is a blind pouch where the small intestine meets with the large intestine what do i mean by blind pouch Uh, everybody can see the board, right? <clears throat> okay, okay. Okay, so now the next thing that is going to happen is, guys, see, we said the rest of the part is going to be colon, but colon is going to be divided into your three parts. See, the first part of the colon, it is going to be moving up. So what did we say? What is this? This is nothing but this is our ascending colon. So that becomes our ascending colon. Okay, the second one. Okay, we said, okay, it is move, going to move in the horizontal direction. What is this? This is going to be our transverse colon. Okay, so ascending colon, transverse colon. And the third one, guys, this is the one which is going to be moving downwards. So what have we called this thing? This is nothing but this is our descending colon. Okay, so the three things they are going to give up, uh, give rise to your entire colon. And finally, guys, now what is going to happen as the food is going to move down through the colon, okay, the water is going to be absorbed, it's going to be converted into a solid fecal matter. And then all that fecal matter is going to be stored into this rectum, right? Once again, guys, the rectum is the third part of your large intestine. But how long is this thing? What is this going to be? So guys, this rectum is approximately 15 centimeters. Okay, and this is a pouch like thing that stores undigested food material. 
it stores all your undigested food material and then what is going to happen you are going to see that when this pouch is going to be full this is going to send impulses to your brain to let you know that now you need to go and defecate okay so this is how it is going to be so finally guys once again just to put it down once okay so we have large intestine large intestine we said this can be divided into your three parts so first one your cecum okay second one is your colon and third one is a rectum always remember in your cecum region okay we are also going to see this worm like structure what was this worm like structure this is nothing but your vermiform appendix okay so vermiform appendix so cecum then we have colon once again colon divided into three parts ascending colon transverse colon and descending colon and finally we have a rectum all right with this thing guys okay uh, after the rectum what is now going to happen you're going to have the anus the anus is nothing but the opening of the large intestine to the outside of the body and this is going to be guarded by a small sphincter which is nothing but your anal sphincter okay under the influence from the spinal cord the anal sphincter opens up the rectum undergoes contraction and pushes all the undigested food material outside from the body once the defecation is done the anal sphincter is going to close and then that entire uh, elementary canal is going to close this is how it is going to happen okay everyone all right with this thing so guys finally the last stage of this thing what is this this is nothing but a removal of your fecal matter so what are we going to call this thing so removal of fecal matter now we have two names for this thing guys so one we can call this thing as defecation or the second thing we can also call this thing as your ejection So defecation or ejection guys never use the term excretion okay why because excretion has a little different meaning excretion means see throughout your entire you know lower standard and all you know you they must have taught you that oh you know uh, like you know what are you when you are defecating what do you call it you call it as excretion but no guys it is not so excretion means the removal of your nitrogenous waste especially your urea uric acid uh, ammonia creatinine etc and how do you remove it from your body guys if you remove it by means of urination okay urination or micturition so guys urine is actually your excretory product not your fecal matter okay so guys get this thing absolutely clear okay so if you want i will just put this thing down out over here so that you keep the same mind excretion is nothing but removal of nitrogenous wastes okay and this is nothing but we call this thing as urination okay so guys don't confuse with urination and uh, excretion and defecation okay so keep this thing in mind okay but now with this guys we are done with your entire elementary canal so we had said in your digestive system guys we have two parts elementary canal and the digestive glands so now the next thing that we have to see is what are your digestive glands and how are they going to really perform their function so before we really move into them guys we need to know what are your glands and how are they going to be so guys what are glands glands are nothing but a similar types of cells coming up together to give rise to your tissues and these tissues guys they are going to give rise to your glands that way so they are going to get the ability to produce certain substances and then we call them as glands okay but now guys let's try to see when we talk about glands what are the two different types of glands present in our body okay so guys the major types of glands that are present let's try to understand so one type of glands how is it going to be you know so for example let's say we are talking about the salivary gland the salivary glands open up into your mouth so let's imagine the salivary gland is something like this okay so let's imagine one of them is going to be below the tongue okay so you have the gland which is below the tongue something of this sort now what happens is this gland is going to produce its own products that is its own secretion that is your saliva but now this saliva needs to open up into your mouth it needs to be delivered into your mouth so what happens guys you know these glands they are going to have a special structure 
these are all going to have these ducts okay these pipes or these ducts which are going to help in the transfer of the saliva into your mouth like this so these ducts they open up to the surface of the mouth and then as and when required what happens you are going to see that the saliva is now going to be sent into the mouth through these ducts Okay, so like this, like this, like this. It is now going to move like this. So first thing, guys, these are the glands which are going to have some special ducts, ducts or channels. Okay, and second thing, they are products. Okay, whatever they are producing, their products are termed as secretions. <clears throat> okay, so what are these glands called? See, these glands, because they are going to have ducts, we call them as duct glands. These are all termed as duct glands. Okay. But now we have another name for this. What do we call them? We call them as exocrine glands. Guys, duct glands or exocrine glands. Okay. And this is the most important thing. Okay. But now once again, guys, what did we say? These are the ones they are going to have some special ducts so they have ducts and secondly they are products whatever they are producing guys only their products are called as secretions so who are we really talking about like which are the examples of glands so let me just give you once again so we have salivary glands okay one okay i'll give you one more then i'll ask you okay so we have salivary glands we have sweat glands they work in the same manner but guys, do you know any other glands who work in this kind of a fashion? Anybody? Anyone? Very nice. Yes. Liver. Very good. Okay. So we have liver. We have pancreas. Now guys, pancreas is actually both exocrine as well as endocrine. Okay. So that is actually mesocrine. So I won't put it out over here. Okay. It has both functions. But then who? anybody else who knows only your exocrine glands only exocrine glands think see i have given you one example sweat glands associated with sweat glands there are many other glands think about it think about it guys anybody i'll give you a hint once again it is present in your skin absolutely very nice, Kanaka. So we are also going to have your tear glands. They are also on the same lines. So we have tear glands. We have oil glands. Guys, oil glands in your skin. We have wax glands. Okay, etc, etc, etc. All these are going to be the ones who have ducts in them. Okay, but now on the other hand guys there are other type of glands now how are these going to be let's try to see so guys these glands they are going to be something like this okay but now these glands these are the one they do not have any kind of ducts to produce their products okay or to you know secrete their products so what happens in this case is guys mostly these glands they are going to be lined by large number of your blood capillaries okay so huge amounts of blood capillaries so surrounding them or covering them or besides them completely now what happens is these guys these glands they are going to produce their own products but because they do not have any kind of ducts, what are they going to do, guys? They are going to take their products and they are going to directly diffuse them into your bloodstream. Directly. What are these kinds of glands called? Guys, because they lack any kind of duct, we call them as ductless glands. Duckless glands. Second thing, because here we call them as exocrine glands, we call these as your endocrine glands. These are termed as endocrine glands. But now, guys, what are the special features out over here? Here we say they do not have ducts. No ducts at all. So their products are going to directly diffuse into your bloodstream. And what are their products called? Guys, do you remember what are their products called? Anybody, anybody, quickly. Their products, very nice, very nice, Zoe, very nice, Kanaka. Okay, their products, their products are known as hormones. Okay, and now guys, let's try to talk about a few examples 
Okay, so what are examples? Let me give you one. This is going to be your pituitary. So we have the pituitary gland earlier. What was pituitary gland called? It was known as master gland. Okay, however, today we call it as your coordinator of endocrine orchestra. Okay, but now after your pituitary gland, let me give you one more. So let's say we are talking about thyroid. Okay, this is also going to be your endocrine gland. But now guys, do you remember any other this thing very nice we have the pineal gland very nice so pineal gland we have adrenal glands right we have yes the gonads very nice the gonads the testes and the ovaries right anything else guys see we have on the top of your thyroid we had said parathyroid so we have parathyroid glands then just coming down into your chest region behind the sternum, we had said once again, there is a bilobe gland. Who was that? That was nothing but your thymus. Okay, etc, etc, etc. So there are going to be different things. Yes, hypothalamus is also, okay, hypothalamus is also your endocrine gland. So guys, this is the difference between your endocrine gland and your exocrine gland. Okay, always remember the biggest difference here, their products were called as secretions, here their products are termed as your hormones. But now in this chapter, guys, what are we going to look at? Are we going to be looking at endocrine glands or are we looking at exocrine glands? We are going to talk about your exocrine glands, okay, because most of the glands, you know, which are involved in the digestive system, they are going to be exocrine in function. Okay, however, there are going to be endocrine glands associated. For example, we have the stomach mucosa, we have the intestinal mucosa. These are the ones they are going to produce certain hormones. At that time, it is going to be endocrine glands. But for the timing, guys, we are looking at exocrine glands only. Okay, chalo. so the first one, guys, let's try to see who is the first one out over here. The first one is nothing but your salivary glands. So let's try to see how are your salivary glands, what do we really need to know, how many of them are going to be available. Okay, so we have salivary glands. Okay, but now these salivary glands, guys, always remember how many pairs do we have? Remember, we have three pairs of glands. Three pairs means what? We are going to have total six, total six salivary glands. How come? three on the left side three on the right side okay it is that way so let's try to see what is the location of your salivary glands where and how it is going to be present okay so let's imagine it is this way okay so now guys the first one that we are going to see is right in front of your ear Okay, so it is going to be right in front and a little below. Okay, so something of this sort. Okay, so this gland which is out over here, guys, what do we call this one? We call this thing as your parotid gland. This is our parotid gland. Okay, then the second one that is going to be present, guys, that is going to be below your jaw. Now, the lower jaw, guys, this is called as mandible. Okay, the upper jaw is called as maxilla, lower jaw is called as mandible. Because this is present somewhere below or lower to your lower jaw, that is why we call this thing as your submandibular gland. Okay, and then the third one, guys, we are going to see that that is going to be exactly below the tongue. Okay, so you are going to have the tongue somewhere out over here and below the tongue we have the third one. Now who is this guys? This is going to be your sublingual gland. This is our sublingual gland. So we have the parotid gland, the submandibular gland and the sublingual gland. Guys, all of them, they are going to be two in number. One on the left side, one on the right side. But now, guys, once again, see, these are going to be your exocrine glands. I told you these are all exocrine glands. So how are they going to deliver their, uh, you know, products that is saliva into the mouth? So for that, guys, you are going to see there are going to be these channels. There are going to be these ducts which open up into your mouth every now and then, guys, like this. 
okay in fact the sublingual one you can actually find out what you can do is you can just take your tongue roll it down okay ulta and then try to suck from the bottom of your mouth you will see a stream of saliva coming out that is where your sublingual glands are Okay, so guys, this is how the entire arrangement is. But now when we talk about your salivary glands, what are your salivary glands actually made up of? So let's try to see. So salivary glands, they are actually going to be made up of your two things. Okay, so two parts basically. So you are going to see, one, we are going to have serous cells. Okay, so we have serous cells. And the second one, we are going to have your mucus cells. Okay. Now let's try to see. Okay. Now serous cells, what are these going to do? Guys, serous cells, they are going to help in the production of enzyme. They produce enzyme. And guys, what enzyme are we talking about? We are talking about tylen. Okay. It produces one of the most important enzyme, tylen, or we also call this thing as salivary amylase. Now, what is this going to do, guys? This tylen is going to work on your starch. Okay. Or salivary amylase. So, what does this tylen do? I'll just give you an idea. See, we have starch. Okay. For example, guys, okay. If you have ever noticed, like even if you take some plain rice and you are like chewing it, chewing it, chewing it, sometimes after a little while, this rice, it starts tasting a little sweet. Now, why is it so? Because this starch which is present, this starch is immediately converted into your maltose. It is broken down, converted into maltose in the presence of the enzyme Tylen or salivary amylase. But maltose is a sugar and maltose is going to taste sweet. So immediately you start getting the sweet taste. Okay, it is because of this reaction of tylen. Okay, but now after this, we have your mucus cells. Now, as the name suggests, guys, mucus cells, what are they going to produce? They are going to help you produce just plain mucus. That's it. So this is what we need to know with regards to our salivary glands. Okay, everybody okay with this? Guys, all right with this? Okay, but now let's try to move ahead and let's try to see the next one, guys. The next one, it is going to be your liver. Okay, so let's see how is this liver, what really happens out over there? Okay, so guys, one thing that you always need to remember is that the liver is the largest the largest endo, uh, exocrine gland ever. Okay, does anybody know who's the largest endocrine gland? Anybody, anybody, any guesses? No, guys, remember it is the thyroid gland. Okay, thyroid is the largest endocrine gland. Liver is the largest exocrine gland. Okay, but now if you're talking about the liver, guys, what is the weight of the liver? The weight of the liver is going to range somewhere in between 1.2 to 1.5 kgs. And guys, remember, the same around 1.5 kgs is also going to be your brain. Okay, so this is most heaviest organ. But now, if you're talking about this, how is the structure? How does this thing really appear? So guys, always remember your liver appears somewhat reddish brown in color. Okay, now why reddish brown? Because it has huge amounts of your blood supply. Okay, huge amounts of blood supply. And at the same time, it is also going to store huge amounts of your iron inside of it. Okay, and that is why we say that, oh, you are also going to be rich in iron okay but now how is this gland guys basically this is going to be a bilobed gland so it generally shows two lobes okay uh, but then each lobe out over here is further divided into two lobes okay so i will just show you explain you what this means each lobe further divided into two
Okay, so let's imagine, see, this is your liver. Okay, it is going to be somewhat triangular in structure. So you are going to see that this portion, it is divided into two. So this is the front portion, guys. So this is one lobe. Similarly, you're going to have one more lobe, which is going to be at the back side. So that is how it is going to be your two lobes. Okay, so two lobes out of by lobe structure and plus each lobe is further divided into two. But now, guys, we need to see how is the structure going to be like, where is the liver? Where is the pancreas? Where is the gallbladder? How is it really going to be? So, guys, what I've done is I've just taken the liver and I've just moved it towards the left a little bit. Okay. Now, when I say left, guys, this is actually right hand side of your body. Okay. And this is going to be left hand side. Okay. Because whatever we are drawing is always a mirror image. Okay, so let's say we have our stomach out over here. So the stomach is like this. Okay, and now the stomach gives rise to your duodenum. Okay, so something of this sort. And then we have your jejunum, ileum, etc. Okay, but now what is going to happen, guys? You are going to see that this liver, what is the main job of the liver, guys? The main job is to produce your bile salts. So bile and the bile salts. Okay, so it is going to produce bile. But now what happens? See, this bile, whatever it produces, it needs to be delivered into the duodenum. So for that, guys, it is going to have a duct. So what is this duct? Guys, through the liver, you are going to see a small duct coming out. This duct, we call this thing as the hepatic duct. Okay. But now, guys, this duct does not directly enter into the duodenum. Now, what happens is this duct, it actually meets with another duct from another gland. So you're going to see another small, you know, ball shaped gland out over here. This gland, it is your gallbladder. Okay. And this gallbladder has another duct, you know, which is going to come and meet with the hepatic duct. Okay. So let me just show you. This is our gallbladder ladder okay and the duct which arises from the gallbladder guys this is called as the cystic duct okay so now what happens the cystic duct and the hepatic duct both of them they are going to unite together okay and as they unite together now what are they going to give rise to guys they are going to give rise to one common structure okay which common structure opens up into the duodenum so what is this common structure, guys? This is nothing but your common bile duct. Okay, so this is our common bile duct. Everybody okay with this thing? Fine. Okay, but now what happens? Okay, you are going to see that where this common bile duct opens up, just besides that, you're going to see one more duct coming from the pancreas. Now, where are the pancreas, guys? So you're going to see the pancreas. They are going to be located between the stomach and the duodenum. Okay, so you are going to see that, oh, we are going to have like this, the pancreas. The pancreas is going to give rise. Okay, so let me just mention. So we have the pancreas. The pancreas is going to give its own duct, which is now going to come and it opens up right besides. Okay, it is going to open up right besides your common bile duct. What is this duct called? This duct is nothing but our pancreatic duct. Okay, so that is pancreatic duct. Okay, guys, once again, I just want you to just go through this structure once to see if everybody is okay with the arrangement.
ओके सो गाइज नाउ इफ एवरीबडी इज ओके विद दिस थिंग देन आई विल यू नो जस्ट मूव अहेड एंड दैट यू नो फ्यू मोर थिंग्स दैट वी नीड टू नो फ्रॉम हियर is everybody okay with the structure guys okay chala so now guys the next thing that we have to see okay so i will i will just take this picture once again okay and i will just show you see initially this is the picture but i want to add few more important things out over here okay and guys this is the most important thing from your neat point of view okay so guys what happens is okay here where this common bile duct and the pancreatic duct are going to open up okay there is a conical projection like this okay it is a conical form because it is a conical v shaped form guys we call this thing as ampulla of water okay water water you can call it whatever you like ampulla of water okay and now what are you going to see is then you are going to have a sphincter out over here a sphincter which is going to open or close depending upon when you want the buy okay so now what happens is this sphincter okay wait a little wait a moment up okay so the sphincter which is going to be covering this guys okay the opening of the common bile duct and the hepatic duct we call this thing as sphincter of audi okay remember this thing very very important guys sphincter of audi and your ampulla of water okay always 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 asked in your exams guys okay always okay now let me just tell you how the functioning of this liver works okay so basically liver is going to okay so let's go through this thing the liver is going to produce your bile so let's say this is all bile being produced out over here so this bile is now going to be sent to the duodenum now the idea is to send it to duodenum right but now what happens is some amount of this thing is now going to travel through the hepatic duct but rather than entering into the duodenum guys now what are you going to see you are going to see that it takes a u turn and it goes into your gall bladder the gall bladder starts storing all the liver and then as and when required the gall bladder releases small amounts of your bile and that enters to the cystic duct comes down out over here enters into the hepatic duct and through the hepatic duct now it enters into the duodenum okay with this thing everybody all right with this fine so this is how it is going to work guys okay but now let's try to move a little ahead okay and guys keep these two things in mind okay you will always find questions in your neat no matter what ampule of water and sphincter of audi okay you will always come across this thing okay but now let's try to move ahead and let's try to see how is the structure of your liver like what really happens out over there and what is the smallest unit what are hepatocytes how do they look like and so on and so forth so guys when we talk about your liver now generally what happens is your liver is going to be covered in a small connective tissue membrane okay now that connective tissue membrane guys we call this thing as your glissens capsule okay however one thing that we need to notice is it is not that you know prominent in your uh, you know humans it is reduced in humans okay but then we are going to see this glissens capsule okay but now this glissens capsule what is this i just told you this is going to be made up of your connective tissue so this is nothing but just a small covering and the third one this is not distinct it is not at all distinct in humans this is it but now guys let's try to do we are going to take a small section from here from the liver okay so i'm just going to take a small section and i'm going to visualize this in your uh, microscope so how does it appear so guys the field of the microscope is going to appear like circular something like this right 
But inside this, guys, what are you going to see? You are going to see some hexagonal structures everywhere. Hexagons, 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 like this, like this, like this. Okay, something of this sort. Everywhere you're going to see hexagonal structures, something of this sort. Okay, so let's imagine something like this. Okay, what are these structures? These are nothing but the basic unit of your liver, guys. Okay, so these hexagons. So we are going to see some hexagonal structures. And these hexagonal structures, guys, this is nothing but we call them as hepatic lobules. Okay, hepatic lobules. Okay. But now, guys, we need to study the structure of hepatic lobules. How do they really look like? Okay, so let's try to see. Okay, so we need to just, uh, you know, move on to one of them. We need to zoom into one of these and then we need to see how it will appear. Okay, so we are going to just talk about the hexagonal structures only, guys. Okay, one single hexagonal structure. Okay, so we have the hepatic lobules okay and now let us see what we are going to see okay so let me just draw something this one sorry Okay, so let me just draw it this way. Okay, it is not like really proper, but it's something of this sort you will see. Okay. No. You hepatocytes, you're going to see it inside of it. Okay, inside this, you'll see hepatocytes. Okay, so now guys, first of all, what are we going to see in this case? Okay, so we are going to see a few things. Okay, so first of all, we are going to say that, okay, this hexagon, whatever we are drawing, okay, but inside of it, basically, you are going to see, like, you know, the structures, that is the cells, the cells, the cells, they are going to be covering it, something of this sort. And whatever those points that are remaining, I will just show it to you what is going to be present on those points. Okay, I will just show it to you. Okay, but now guys, first thing that we are going to come across is right in the center, there is going to be some open space. Okay, this is a small open kind of a thing. Now, this open space, this is going to be for the central vein. Okay, so we see this is the space for central vein. Okay, and central vein meaning what is this? This is ultimately going to go to your hepatic vein. Okay, but now after this, what are you going to see? You know, guys, you are going to see that there are going to be these lines, 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 lines. Okay, so you are going to see that, sir, there are going to be these cells which are going to be arranged in these, you know, lines, 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 lines manner like this, like, you know, spokes of a tire, okay, in a radial, radial fashion like this, like this. Okay, so some, now I am just drawing, you know, representative things. Okay, guys, so this is going to be like, you know, highly messed up, like, you know, huge number of your spokes, spokes, spokes like this. I'm just showing you a uh, few things. Okay, and you are also going to see that, you know, here, 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 whatever these, these are going to be all covered with your cells. Like this. Okay, but now what happens? Well, what are these cells actually? And how are they going to be arranged? Like, you know, why are they arranged like this? So guys, basically, you are going to see that these things, whatever we are showing, these are nothing but our hepatocytes. And hepatocytes are nothing but the basic unit of your liver. And now, how are they going to be? Always remember, they are going to be arranged in rows. 
they will be arranged in rows and these rows whatever these rows are we call them as hepatic cords these are termed as hepatic cords but now guys what is the job of your hepatocytes now hepatocytes what are they going to do guys see you have always come across this reaction excess of glucose is converted into glycogen and stored in the liver so that is the job guys so this is going to store it stores glycogen and at the same time guys this is also going to help in the storage of fats because excess of glucose will also be converted into fats so that way okay so you are going to see something like this okay so we are going to see hepatocytes but now after this hepatocytes guys you are going to see that there are certain cells okay now these are a little indistinct cells kind of thing which are floating in these hepatic lobules okay now what are these cells called now guys these are like you know very very important cells why because we call them as kaffir cells okay now what are these kaffir cells now guys these kaffir cells they are phagocytic in nature and because they are phagocytic in nature they are going to kill any kind of germs or they also help in breakdown of your rbcs so because see rbcs are ultimately going to be broken down in your liver only right so kill germs and break down rbcs these are very very important because they provide immunity to your uh, liver okay but along with this guys what are you going to see that inside this you are going to see that there are some blood pools out over here blood pools okay so these blood pools guys we call them as your blood sinusoids okay these blood pools these are our blood sinusoids okay so that's it okay but now guys we need to see a few more things out over here okay now what are we going to see see these points 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 whatever that are there in those you are going to see like three different things present okay so sometimes it is three different things sometimes it is four different things it depends so let me just show you three different things out over here okay so let's say here 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 in there are one two three one two three okay and in let's say this one there are actually four things out over here then one two three something like this okay so what are these three things that are present and what is the fourth thing that is going to be there so guys what we see is here inside this you are going to see three things first thing you are going to have the hepatic artery okay so hepatic artery okay one okay second thing you are going to see down below it is going to be hepatic vein so hepatic artery then we are going to have hepatic vein and third thing in that guys we are also going to see your lymph vessels so finally lymph vessels and guys the fourth one i have shown you out over here see sometimes there is going to be this now what is that that is nothing but your bile duct okay so sometimes it may be present like that bile duct and this is the structure of your hepatic lobules okay so guys just have a look at this just see if you are okay and in the meanwhile what i will do is i'll just take one picture which i downloaded and i'll just show it to you Okay, one minute. There is one question, sir. Can you explain the central vein? The central vein is basically one part which is like you know a little empty space which is present in the center, okay, which is for your hepatic, the uh, basically the central vein, the hepatic vein. So it is for that reason. Very clear. Yeah, one minute. I downloaded that.
okay so that is yeah okay so see this is going to look something like this see i told you that the hepatic these things they are going to be like you know uh really really uh like you know tightly packed so i'm just showing you like you know little spokes spokes but it is going to appear something like this There was one more diagram which I had downloaded. There were two diagrams. One minute, I'm just looking for the other diagram which I had downloaded. What is a portal vein? A portal vein is the one which is going to connect uh, this thing that is the stomach and the intestines with the liver. It starts with a capillary, it ends with a capillary. That is your hepatic portal vein. Okay, one minute. There was one more diagram which I had taken, but I'm not getting it somehow. One moment, huh? I'll just once again search for it. No, I'm not able to get it one minute. It'll take you one minute. Okay, so here. One. Okay, so guys, see, once again, the same kind of thing. Again, the pattern remains exactly the same. You just need to remember, like, you know, few things out over there that, you know, on the sides, you're going to see three things out over here, sometimes bile duct, you know, lymph vessels, your uh, hepatic artery, hepatic vein. Okay, so for that. Okay, just have a look. If everybody is okay with this thing, then we can move ahead. This is a representative diagram, okay? I, this is also a representative diagram. Actually, you're going to see it something like this. Canaliculi is basically small spaces, like, you know, a uh, small opening, small this thing. That is for here, you can see bile canaliculi. Where is it? One minute, I'll show you. Bile canaliculi. In, the, in this thing, there are going to be small, this thing, one minute. Uh, see here, here, bile canaliculi. These are like, you know, small spaces for the biles to travel through. Okay, is everybody all right, guys? <laughs> guys, is everybody okay with this? Sure, can we move ahead? Okay. Fine. So guys, in your exams, when they ask you to draw, you need to draw it something like this only. Okay. Only representative thing. If you go to draw this thing, guys, this will, you know, at least require like, you know, 10, 15 minutes to draw like this. So don't ever draw it in this fashion. Draw it like this or draw it like this. And this should be good enough. Okay. Sure. Okay, however, from your textbook, now this has been edited out. So it is you won't find it in your textbook anymore. Okay, so 
anyways but then from the neat point of view this is like a really really important okay but now guys let's try to see what are the functions of your liver so we said oh we are having liver the liver is very important and all this and that but what are the functions what does it really do okay so let's try to put them down one by one okay so first of all guys as we have just said that this is the one which is going to help in the formation of bile that is the most important thing second thing guys what is this going to do is this is going to regulate your glucose levels in the blood okay regulates glucose levels in the blood and guys how is this going to do see whatever excess glucose that is there whatever excess glucose that we have in our body this is now going to be converted into your glycogen and glycogen is stored in the liver right but now when you want it okay like let's say for example now we have like taken all the excess glucose we have stored it guys do you know who is going to bring about this reaction guys which hormone is going to bring about this conversion of glucose to glycogen who influences this absolutely right zoe has given me the right answer waiting for the others to answer can anybody else give me the answer guys <laughs> guys this is brought about in the presence of your insulin okay but now when you require glucose let's say see your body has used huge amounts of glucose the glucose levels are going down now the same body is now going to go to the liver and it is going to ask the liver that bhai abhi mereko wapas de de glucose right in that case you are going to see that this whatever glycogen that was stored this glycogen is now going to be broken down and it is converted into glucose and glucose is poured into the blood to increase the blood glucose levels do you guys know which is this hormone guys this is going to be glucagon very nice way okay so you have insulin and we have glucagon both of them they work exactly in the opposite manner and help to regulate your blood glucose levels okay but now let's try to move ahead now just like it regulates your blood glucose levels guys this also regulates your amino acid levels okay now let's try to see how does it regulate amino acid levels okay so let's try to see so guys now what happens is sometimes you are going to see that the proteins they are going to enter into the liver okay guys and please pay attention now huh? please pay attention the proteins they enter into the liver but as they enter into the liver guys they are going to undergo a process which is called as deproteinization now by deproteinization what happens is you are going to see that these proteins they are going to be broken down into amino acids okay so they are immediately broken down into amino acids okay fine but now the moment we have amino acids guys these amino acids undergo another process that is deamination and once again where is this taking place it's taking place in the liver itself guys okay so they have undergone deamination now but what is this deamination how does it work so guys if i talk about this amino acid one structure of amino acid i'll just show you this is r c h c o o h and n h 2 this is the structure of one single amino acid now see this r group r is alkyl group okay what do i mean by alkyl group meaning it keeps on changing every now and then okay so it can be c 2 h 5 c h 3 it can be c 6 h 8 okay anything of that sort okay so that keeps on changing okay but now this carbon hydrogen this on the other side carboxylic group and this amino group now you may say sir amino group i said amino group was nh2 but idhar maine likha hai h2n is it right or is it wrong guys remember this is the right because n is bonded with carbon and that is why we write it this way okay otherwise you know if i write this as like you know nh Two and then it is bonded with C. That means hydrogen is bonded with carbon, which is wrong. Okay, so please remember this thing that 
this is how you represent it okay but now let's try to see what is going to happen out of it okay chalo so guys in this process of deamination now we are going to see that this amino group whatever that was there that is going to be cleaved off it is removed from that part okay so what are you going to see see in this case this entire amino group see you are going to just remove this thing so i am going to show that this has been removed so it is nh2 okay but now if i am giving rise to nh2 now what is going to happen guys this nh2 i can just take your one more hydrogen atom i can adjust it out over here what am i going to get ammonia ammonia is then going to be converted into your urea and guys now what happens to the urea this urea now because we are mammals okay we will generally produce waste as urea this urea is now going to enter see this can be converted into uric acid also okay but we will avoid converting it into uric acid because we are ureotelic meaning we excrete urea okay in the urine so now what happens is this urea is now going to enter into the blood from the blood it is now going to travel to the kidneys and now the kidneys are going to remove it in the form of urine kidneys are going to remove it in the form of urine this is how it is going to work okay but now what about this remaining part what about this part which is still present now guys this part whatever that is there this is now going to be converted into glucose some or the other way this is converted into glucose and now there can be two possibilities either this glucose can be used directly for respiration immediately or this can be stored inside the liver and then used for later use that way so this is how it is going to be like so guys this is the next thing that is how amino acids are going to be regulated so guys i want you to go through this once just see if you are okay then only we'll move ahead with the next part okay everybody all right guys everybody good okay okay chalo so now let's try to move ahead guys and let's try to see the next other jobs that are done by your liver okay so now what is this also going to do in uh, for us guys remember when you are in the fetal stage at that time your bone marrow is not developed okay so if your bone marrow is not developed then your rbcs cannot be produced properly so who produces rbcs it is your liver so produces fetal rbcs okay fine next thing along with this guys this also produces blood clotting factors okay so who are we talking about blood clotting proteins or blood clotting factors so we are going to have guys your prothrombin and fibrinogen prothrombin fibrinogen okay these are required for blood clotting okay guys but now just like it helps in clotting of the blood it also helps in preventing its clotting so we say it produces anticoagulant also it produces anticoagulant meaning which prevents the coagulation of blood and what is that anticoagulant that is nothing but heparin okay so why do we require clotting proteins and anticoagulant at the same time the reason is when the blood is flowing through your blood vessels at that time it should not clot so at that time the heparin is the one which is preventing the blood from clotting but if by any chance there is a cut then what happens guys this prothrombin and fibrinogen they are going to start working together to give rise to clotting this is how we will we are going to manage it okay next thing guys 
along with this it is going to stores huge amounts of your water and because it stores water it is also going to maintain your blood volume okay fine chalo next thing okay now just like it uh, you know it see we said you know this is the one which is going to maintain blood volume it is the one who's going to produce your rbcs right at the same time guys this is also going to be responsible for destroying your rbcs like we said we know we have kaffir cells right so it destroys but which rbcs it is going to destroy worn out or it is going to destroy your dead rbcs okay fine along with this next thing this is also responsible for detoxification okay so guys if by any chance you are taking any kind of drugs any kind of your toxins any kind of poison anything for even that matter you have alcohol where is it going to be broken down guys ultimately it is going to be broken down in your liver only because this is the place where detoxification takes place okay then next thing guys this is the place from where you are going to see elimination also taking place so first it is going to detoxify them and then elimination of your toxic waste okay fine the next thing guys after this what are we going to have now this is the one which is going to help in the storage okay the storage of various kinds of vitamins okay vitamins like what vitamins like a d k and b12 b12 is your cyanocobalamin okay so basically a d k b12 okay storage of vitamins also guys it is along with storage of vitamins it is also going to help in the storage of minerals and especially which mineral are we talking about guys we are talking about iron if for any reason you have any kind of deficiency of iron the doctor will always advise you to have chicken liver or mutton liver because it has huge amounts of iron inside of it and lastly guys your liver is also responsible for thermoregulation okay meaning maintenance of your body heat Now, guys, we say we are warm-blooded animals. Why are we warm-blooded? It because your liver produces so much amounts of heat. Okay, extreme amounts of heat, which is going to keep your body warm. That is why we are going to be warm-blooded animals, guys. Okay, so these are all the functions of your liver. Okay, so just have a look at this. If anybody has any doubts, anything you wish to ask, quickly ask. or else we'll move on to your pancreas okay everybody okay all right let's move ahead okay chalo so now let's try to move on to your pancreas let's try to see how are they what are they what do we really need to know about them okay so this is the third thing that we need to know okay so now guys when i talked about pancreas what is pancreas i said it is going to be both exocrine as well as endocrine so what are these kinds of glands called we call them as mesocrine glands okay so these are going to be both exocrine as well as endocrine in function okay but now when it is acting as an exocrine gland what is it going to produce guys this is going to produce your pancreatic juice 
okay it produces pancreatic juice and this pancreatic juice it is going to help in your digestion that is the job as an exocrine gland but now if it is an endocrine gland then what is it going to produce this is going to produce your hormones okay but now how are these hormones what is going to happen let's try to see so guys see we have shown that the pancreas is going to appear something like this it is a leaf like structure out over there okay but now dispersed inside okay you are going to see there are going to be a few groups of cells which are floating here and there in between now what are these groups of cells called these groups of cells guys we call them as islets of langerhans islets means what these are small islets okay and langerhans was the scientist yes very nice kanaka very nice okay so we have islets of langerhans but now these islets of langerhans guys inside there are going to be three different cells present now what are the three different cells so first one we have alpha beta and guys once again remember this is delta generally kids go alpha beta gamma but no this is not gamma this is alpha beta and delta okay but now all of them they are going to produce their own hormone so what are we looking at so alpha cells they are responsible for the production of glucagon beta cells they are responsible for the production of insulin and third we have delta cells they produce somatostatin they produce somatostatin okay but now what is the job out over here let's try to see so this glucagon what does it do is guys always remember glucagon just remember this thing as glucag on glucag on means what glucose on okay so glucose on so what is this going to do this increases blood glucose levels this increases blood glucose levels okay fine but now we have insulin insulin is going to work exactly in the opposite manner this decreases blood glucose levels so my question to you guys is in between glucagon and insulin guys who do you think is going to be more important for you is it glucagon or is it insulin what do you think who is better for your body absolutely right very nice zoe very nice rishik okay remember both of them are equally important yes very nice darshanita why are they equally important guys because just without one you cannot maintain the blood glucose level see if the blood glucose levels are increasing tremendously you would require insulin to maintain them and if the blood glucose levels are dropping down tremendously then you require glucagon to maintain them right so i cannot say that either one of them is important it is both of them they are equally important because they go hand in hand with one another to maintain your blood glucose levels okay fine so that is going to be insulin but then what about your somatostatin guys somatostatin this is the one which is going to maintain a balance between the two okay it maintains balance between the two that is what we need to know with regards to your hormones but now we need to talk about these you know uh, like what exactly is happening in your pancreas like you know how is it really going to appear what happens so let's try to see a ts of your pancreas okay so guys one second let's say ye kaun sa color aa gaya okay so let's say in sorry Hmm. so let's say we have our pancreas something like this and let's say we are taking a section of the pancreas now we need to look inside what are these cells and also i just shown you we have islets of langer hands out over here let's say let's say like this okay and always remember i am just showing three dots it doesn't mean that you know there have to be three dots it can be large number of cells out over here okay this is just a way of a representation okay so now guys what happens is let's say i have taken one section from your pancreas like this and now i'm going to observe it under your microscope 
so once again what are i what am i going to see so first thing you are going to have like you know you are going to see that circle because you know uh the section like microscope always looks like this okay now what are you going to see inside guys inside you are going to see that there are going to be once again some lobules 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 okay see earlier we had had like hepatic lobules right now here there are going to be these kinds of lobules which we call them as acini or pancreatic lobules okay so these i'll just mention we are going to see this acini or we call them as pancreatic lobules but what is so special about the pancreatic lobules guys what are you going to see inside is inside you are going to have some flask shaped cells okay so you have something of this sort like okay, flask shaped cells means what you know guys you are going to see that the base it is going to be broad and the top portion is going to be a little narrow see when we talk about a flask a flask appears to be like this okay so you will see these cells to be something of that sort okay so flask shaped cells okay this is an important characteristic okay so guys keep this thing in mind one minute so some error hmm. okay okay so same way guys right out over here at the bottom side also you are going to have these flask shaped cells okay this is a characteristic okay so let me just uh, say this thing that you know the, these things they are going to have the flask shaped cells or your acini okay but now what is going to happen see this central portion that i have shown what exactly is going on with this central portion guys in this central portion you are going to see that these flask shaped cells they are going to produce the pancreatic juice and that is released out over there guys so this is for pancreatic juice okay and now along with this see we said you know you are going to have these islets of langerhans also so let me just show you okay these islets of langerhans they are going to be floating just like that and as i said you know you are going to have like a group of cells it is not going to be just three cells floating okay at groups of cells like this and this is how it is going to appear guys and this is nothing but islets of langerhans and now these islets of langerhans once again you have to mention it is going to have alpha beta and delta cells okay one second what is alpha going to produce alpha is going to produce glucagon beta is going to produce insulin and delta is going to produce somatostatin so if you label everything like this guys you will get full marks for this thing okay but one second guys just have a look at it and i will show you <laughs> diagram which i had downloaded
Okay, everybody all right with this? So let me just show you this thing. Okay, so this is the one which I had downloaded for you guys. So one second, see, you are going to see that, see, we have this asini, asini, asini everywhere. And this center one, okay, this is nothing but your islets of Langerhans. Okay, so like this. And these are asini flash shaped cells. And then, you know, right inside the center, we have the place for your pancreatic juice. Everyone okay with this thing? Guys, getting this part properly? Okay, in your exams, they ask you this for two marks, okay? So make sure you know this thing properly. Okay, so guys, once again, what we will do is we'll stop over here for the day. And once again, I'll see you in the next class. Till then, take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Yes, yes, yes. I will send it right now itself. Immediately, I'll send it. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.